Our next minor prophet is Micah. So Micah lived and prophesied during the last half of the 8th century, which is roughly 750 to 700 BC. And we see how it is that some of these prophets are beginning to overlap, like Isaiah, when he comes on the scene, he's going to be prophesying at the same time. How it is that essentially one prophet lights the match, Amos, and once we have one prophet prophesying, all of a sudden other prophets are speaking in God's name and we're collecting their oracles, their prophecies, and writing them down as well. So Micah is another collection of prophecies or oracles. Lived at a time when many of the rulers of Israel in the north were self-centered, morally corrupt, and corrupting others. His prophecies come around or just after the time of destruction of the northern kingdom. So we talked about the historical events that were happening. How it was that Israel rose up and Assyria and the Assyrian Empire came in and hoarded them all from their land. Micah is, is just right before that time or right around that time of, the, of those events that are happening. Micah is concerned for the poor and the exploited, denouncing those who misuse power, which is why Micah is well liked by social justice advocates. If you are advocating, you know, many groups that, that advocate for social justice issues like Austin Interfaith, they're always appealing to the words of prophets like Micah because they're talking about how Micah appeals for, you know, makes an appeal to those who are in power on behalf of those who are in need. For instance, Micah says in chapter 7, verses 2 to 3, The faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judges accept bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together, condemning those in power because of how it is that they're treating other persons. <clears throat> Why is all of this so important? Because we saw before, Amos' focus was on justice over worship. For Micah, injustice is akin to turning your back on God. If you're treating other people that way, that's like turning your back on God. If you're turning your back on other people, that's you're turning your back on God. He talks about judges who capitulate to the rich. Going back to our example of my giving Deacon Angelita, we're imagining her to be a judge and me giving her $20,000 to sway it in my favor. Interesting, if she were to capitulate to me to do what I want her to do because I've given her money, then that would go against Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15, how it is that judges need to be impartial. By accepting my gift, is she now partial? Micah's world is comprised of six elements. When we read the book of Micah, we hear of six different uh, persons or groups of persons. We have God, the prophet, and the common people. And then on the other side of God, the prophet, and the common people, we have the ruler, who is akin to God. Other prophets, we have our prophet and we have other prophets. And those in authority as opposed to the common people. Micah suggests that those in authority have coveted what belongs to others, have perverted justice, and that their religiosity is hypocritical. Yikes! So that all that we do in terms of our worship, those of us who are in power, if we're neglecting the needs of the poor, then all of our worship is hypocritical. Other prophets lead people astray. They speak words of comfort as long as their stomachs are full. How interesting. Remember professional golfers? What's the difference between professional golfers and amateur golfers? Professional golfers make money. Professional prophets, they make money. Do they make money by preaching prophecies of doom and gloom? No, it's... I'm sure that it's a better day for them to be preaching and prophesying about good things that are going to be happening to the king, right? It's when they start to it's when they start to prophesy against the king and against the nation that the king says, "Go flee to Judah." So it says that the false prophets declare a war against those who put nothing into their mouths, meaning the poor, and they give oracles 
for money, says Micah, chapter 3, verse 11. Micah says, these prophets will be punished, and that Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins. How interesting, what happens with Jerusalem in the end? In the end, Assyria, the Assyrian Empire is going to take over Jerusalem and destroy the temple as well, so that Jerusalem will literally be a heap of ruins. He says, they will be in the dark, and there will be no response from God to those prophets. Interesting that they didn't even use the words prophets, but of course they referred to them as prophets. But a prophet literally is one through whom God speaks. So a false prophet is really something that doesn't... I mean, either you're a prophet and God is speaking through you, or you're not a prophet. Um, some of Micah's prophecies... How, inter how interesting that Micah... We said that Micah lives at the same time as Isaiah, proto-Isaiah, first Isaiah. And he, has, he shares many parallels with proto-Isaiah, such that, for instance... Both Micah and Proto-Isaiah talk about God's fidelity enduring despite God's wrath. Despite the fact that God is upset with us because we've broken the covenant, despite the fact that God's not happy, God continues to be faithful to us. Isn't that the message of Hosea? Even though we stray, God continues to be faithful. Micah and Proto-Isaiah, they both say that God remains the light of the faithful that God is the king of Israel, that God has chosen the Davidic dynasty for the salvation of the people. How interesting that God is going to, to bring salvation to the people through the house of David. Why is that important for writers like Matthew in our Christian scriptures? Because Matthew needs to show how it is that the Messiah comes from the house of David. So if the Messiah is going to come from the house of David, the city of David is Bethlehem. Where does the Messiah have to be born? Bethlehem, the city of David. And we also have to show how it is that Jesus comes from the lineage of David, from the, how it is that, that David's descendants can be traced all the way to Jesus. Swords into plowshares, have we heard that before? That's an image that we hear during ad, the Advent season. One more time, let's try to understand these. We all know what swords are for people who sword fight. Imagine, instead of using those swords for fighting with one another and dueling, if we were to bend those swords and use them on our plows instead. You know, plows have those prongs that go down into the earth. That's what our swords would be used for. That we're going to live in peace with one another, and we'll no longer need swords. Take that sword that you are using to protect yourself and to, to, to kill other people, and you can turn that into a plowshare, into one of those prongs in a plow, because you won't need your sword anymore. Spears and pruning hooks. We all know what spears are. So we'll just carry their spears. Imagine if, and since they don't need spears anymore, we're going to be living in peace. They don't need spears. Instead, you could use them to, to get the fruit out of the trees. So both Micah and Isaiah, proto-Isaiah, share those images. It would, it would lead us to believe that either one got that image from the other, or that they both got that image from some other source. How do we know Micah as Christians? Micah in the Christian scriptures? Micah tells us that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? Again, Bethlehem is the city of David. If the Messiah is going to come out from the city of David, then Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. What does Micah say in chapter 5? But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel. Whoa! Think about Matthew reading this line trying to figure out, wait a minute, if Jesus is the Messiah, let's, let's read this carefully. You Bethlehem, though you're small, out of you will come the ruler of Israel. If Jesus is the ruler of Israel that Micah was talking about, then Jesus has to come from where? From Bethlehem. So Micah obviously influenced Matthew in that respect. Matthew chapter 2, verse 6 talks about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. <clears throat> Remember, it was even in Matthew that we had to figure out how to get Jesus to Bethlehem. What story did we use to get Jesus to Bethlehem? Because you know that Jesus' family, you know, we, we're talking about Nazareth, which is in the north. How did we get Jesus down to Bethlehem? Oh, got a story for that. What was the story? The census. Remember that? In the time of, of, of Augustus, how it was that there was a census went up, so they had to leave their hometown and go down to Bethlehem for the census, said Matthew. And then Matthew said, once they gave birth, was the story over? No, then there was the, the massacre of infants, so they had to flee to Egypt. 
Why did those two events happen? To fulfill two prophecies from the minor prophets that we've discussed this evening. How it was that, according to Micah, Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And how it was that, according to Hosea, Jesus would come up, or the Messiah would come up, out of Egypt. I call my son out of Egypt. We also are familiar with Micah in our Christian scriptures because there are various parallels to talk about familial unrest and discord in Micah 7, 6. For a son dishonors his father, a daughter rises up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, etc. Where have we heard phrases similar to that? What does Jesus tell us? Right? A son will turn against father, father against son, daughter against mother, mother against daughter. So this person is that person. How it is that division is going to be occurring. So, when Jesus' family was divided and thinking, this guy is crazy, let's take him home. Right? How it is that they would have been looking at probably like this saying, well, the division is going to happen. Two texts that we can pull out of Micah. David Zucker pulls two texts for our study. The first is Micah chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. This is a reaction to Micah's preaching by those in power. So Micah chapter 2, their prophets, meaning, okay, so we remember that there's God, and there's the prophet, Micah, and there's the common people. On the other side is the ruler, and the other prophets who are helping to inform the ruler, and those in authority. So, their prophets are saying what? Do not prophesy, Micah. Right? They're telling Micah, do not prophesy. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will overtake us. Your descendants of Jacob, another name for Israel, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to one whose ways are upright? Lately, my people have risen up like an enemy. What's written there, essentially the denunciation of false prophets. But if we look farther up in Micah chapter 2, chapter 2 verses 1 through 5, really is a condemnation of those who are in power. This is probably why Micah was not very popular. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. They covet fields and seize them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. So essentially, those who are taking advantage of others, woe to you. You're going to get what's coming to you. Therefore the Lord says, verse 3, chapter 2, I am planning disaster against this people. What was the disaster that we would later interpret it as being? The exile. From which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. In that day people will ridicule you, they will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. Anyone who comes preaching anything like that, prophesying anything like that, is probably not going to be extremely welcome. The other text study is Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, a city set on a hill. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest mountain. It will be exalted above all the hills, and peoples will stream to it. We have this image of all the, pe all the, people, of the all people of all nations coming to the Lord. The Lord's temple will be established on the highest mountain above any others. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between nations. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. We're all going to live in peace with one another. That's the message here. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord, one God, our God, forever and ever. So how it is that God's house will be established, all the nations will come into it, and we'll all be living in peace. That sword, that spear that you have, you can use them for other things. 
We're going to be living in peace with one another. Which is a consoling image only because the previous <coughs> chapter, chapter 3, especially verse 12, ended on this note of disaster of Jerusalem ending up in a heap of ruins. So on the one hand, you finish chapter 3, heap of ruins. Chapter 4, this consoling image of Jerusalem being lifted up. We see that Micah is a very short book of the Bible, which is, of course, why we refer to Micah as one of the minor prophets. 